Good evening and welcome to Bangor Worldwide 2020 online. I'm here on the seafront in Bangor, standing in front of one of its most familiar landmarks, the McKee Clock. The clock stands in the marina's sunken gardens. And for many years, this was the venue for the morning meetings of the Bangor Worldwide Missionary Convention. The meetings were evangelistic in flavor and included testimonies from the various missionaries who were participating in the convention. The meetings continued for many years and only ceased in the mid 1980s. We are glad you're joining us for this week of Worldwide. We know it's not quite the same watching online as it is being here in person, but we encourage you to enter into the praise and the prayer and to allow your horizons to be broadened and your heart to be moved as you hear of how the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ is being proclaimed to the ends of the earth. Thank you. 
Let us join together in prayer. Let us pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we give thanks for how you spoke at many times and in many ways to those who prepared the way for the Messiah to come. We praise you that you have now spoken fully and finally through your Son, who is the radiance of your glory, the exact representation of your being, and the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. We pray for the people of the Middle East, both Jew and Arab, that they may see in Jesus the fulfillment of the ages and come to confess him as their Lord and Savior. Grant your special blessing on those who are seeking to present the gospel of Christ to Jewish people. Grant that the incarnate, crucified, risen and ascended Lord may be so presented to them that they may find eternal life in him and tell it out among the nations that he is the Christ of God. We pray for those who will speak to us tonight. May they open our eyes and imaginations to the mighty work that you are doing throughout the world. And will you pour out the Holy Spirit to make the rest of your church like the best of your church, that many may come to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus to the praise of your glory and grace. Amen. This year, Bangor Worldwide is launching a new initiative called Friends of Worldwide. As a friend of Worldwide, you can help to support and to grow the work of the Bangor Worldwide Missionary Convention. All you have to do is contribute a regular monthly amount of your choice. Please have a look at this little video, which will tell you more about how to become a friend of Worldwide. I absolutely love the week of Bangor Worldwide. As we gather together in the mornings to pray together, then the incredible Bible teaching, and in the evening as we hear from people, from missionaries right around our world of what God is doing, we're already beginning to pray through and think through and plan for 21 and 22. And you know, it's incredible that this ministry has been going now for, this is the 84th year, but it just doesn't happen. It costs money. And it, for that week, it costs approximately 30,000 pounds to run. And so in thinking through, how do we continue this ministry? How do we realize this vision that started all those years ago? And how do we engage people in mission and keep that profile there? And we would love to invite you to prayerfully consider joining with us to committing to be a friend of Bangor Worldwide. If you would like to commit to giving perhaps five, maybe 10 pounds per month to enable us to continue this ministry. But in any commitment, any friendship, there are always two sides and we are going to be committed to you as well. We will send out to you a monthly prayer update of what is happening with the missionaries that we are supporting, enable you to pre-book for special events and our opening nights and pre-book seats. And as a bonus, if you sign up before the 31st of August, we will give you a free copy of this book by Gary Miller, Need to Know. 
our heart is to channel money out to the missionaries to serve these people that are coming, that are speaking, these partners that we have all over the world. Because while we all cannot go, we can give, we can pray. So as we step out in faith and as we plan the next few years, we would love you to join us because we believe as we do take that step and we believe that God will provide through his people, we would ask you to join us in praying that he will and this will continue so as we can pass this baton on to the next generation and the next. That someone is standing here in Ward Park in Bangor in another 85 years talking about what God has done through this ministry. This evening, our mission input comes from Asaf Peled. Asaf was born and raised on a kibbutz in Israel, at which a more secular expression of Judaism was the norm. From an early age, he began seeking answers to life's big questions. Unable to deny that there was a God, he eventually read a copy of the New Testament, which his parents had been given. This ultimately resulted in Asaph turning to Jesus as Messiah and the beginning of his ministry to his own Jewish people. Now based in Amsterdam, Asaf is a gifted evangelist who is helping Jewish people in Holland find Jesus for themselves through street evangelism and by engaging in one-to-one -one contact. He is in touch with a number of local Jewish business owners and he conducts Bible studies with a number of Jewish people from Orthodox to atheists, seeking to introduce them to Jesus, the Messiah of Israel. Tonight, we will also hear from Harry, not his real name, who lived in the Middle East for 15 years. During that time, Harry worked with both traditional and house churches. He now travels into a number of churches in the Arab, Turkic, and Persian worlds, and will be sharing what he sees God doing in these difficult areas and what he and his colleagues have been learning. Following the mission input, we have a short challenge from Gary Miller on the gospel-shaped life from 1 John. Gary served as a PCI minister here in Hamilton Road in Bangor, and then in Hoth and Malahide on the north side of Dublin, before taking up his current position as principal of the Queensland Theological College in Brisbane. Tonight, Gary will focus on 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17, where loving the world doesn't fit with the love God has shown us in the gospel, and it doesn't last. You might want to have your Bible handy when that time comes. Shalom. In the time that we have together, I want to speak about Romans 1 verse 16. This wonderful verse provides a very powerful mandate to missions in general and to Jewish mission in particular. I will read Romans 1 verse 16 and 17 and then focus with you on verse 16. Hear God's word. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed, from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. The beauty of these verses is hidden in plain sight. This passage is quite well known. You have probably heard someone preach about it before. But as is the case with many, the truth here is so obvious that you may have not given it much thought and after a while you simply don't see it anymore. Many view this passage as the core of the letters to the Romans. In it we read about the treasure of the Christian faith, that all are welcome to come and be saved and that our salvation lies in 
putting our faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. For now, I will confine myself to the main issues that are relevant to our missionary work among the Jewish people. First of all, I want you to notice how Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. So obviously, we could point out that Paul is using here a litotus. And if you don't know what a litotus is, you're in good company because I myself have only learned this word recently. A litotus, a way of using a negative uh, expression to express something positive. So with Paul, he is using it to uh, express his pride in the gospel, something that he states positively elsewhere. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So certainly, Paul is proud of the gospel and he does glory in the cross. But there is more than Lytotus here. It sounds very negative to start by speaking about shame in the gospel. But actually, it's quite realistic. Shame is one of the greatest enemies of preaching the gospel, especially if you are placed in a hostile context. And let me disclose to you that I know a bit myself about this temptation to be ashamed about the gospel. How about you? Now, of course, I can't see any of you, but I imagine that there may be some raised eyebrows now. So let me hide behind the stalwart figure of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. In his exposition of this verse, he stated, I am very ready to assert that if you have never known this particular temptation, then it is probably due to the fact, not that you are an exceptionally good Christian, but that your understanding of the Christian message has never been clear. Consider that even a faithful servant like Timothy had to be admonished by Paul. I read to you. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Just take a moment to think about our proclamation, at least in the way that it is perceived by outsiders. So you mean to tell me, an outsider would say, that an unseen God that I have never heard about has created the world and has issued a list of rules that I have not kept and that therefore I have to be punished? But in order to save me from this problem that I didn't know I had, God sent his son to Israel thousands of years ago to die on a Roman cross for my sins, and that if I believe in him, my relationship with God will be restored? You can imagine, perhaps, that this message sounded quite far-fetched to the ancient Romans in the days of the New Testament. Well, today's world is not much different. And for me, bringing this gospel message to Jewish people in the Netherlands, another element is added that when I bring, when I start speaking with God, uh, with them about God, they tell me it's as pointless as selling ice to the Eskimos. When I shared the gospel for the first time with Lewis, a secular Jewish fr uh, contact of mine about my age, there were, uh, he actually tried to make fun of it. To him, an, an Israeli atheist, there clearly was no reason to take the New Testament seriously. So the world tells us that we should feel ashamed about the gospel, but obviously we must not take its word for it. The Apostle Paul didn't do it either. 
the gospel really is glorious and powerful, not just because you and I have experienced it personally, but because it is true. Just like Paul, we know that the gospel doesn't just sound beautiful, it is beautiful. Look already in verse 4 of chapter 1. Paul says there that it is through the resurrection from the dead that Jesus proved powerfully that he is the Son of God. The empty tomb and the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the power and hope of the Christian faith. But the gospel itself is powerful. Paul says that it is the power of God. It is not just a story about how God saves people. It is also the means by which he saves people. Everyone who puts his trust in Jesus as Savior, as Lord, is saved into a glorious fellowship with God. So the gospel is information that leads to transformation. On this gospel, I put my trust as I tell Jewish people about Jesus. So although Lewis was negative at first and tried to ridicule the gospel, he has since shown much more interest in learning about Jesus and the New Testament. This is in part because of the reasonable arguments that I have given him about the Christian faith, but perhaps even more because of the testimony of Christian love that I and my family have shown him. Some time ago, as I, were, as I was returning home from a tough outreach in Amsterdam, I heard from my French colleague, Aurel, the sweet news that Celeste had come to faith. Celeste is a young Jewish woman from Sephardic background whom he met at, uh, at the beginning of the year. And he has since regularly met with, uh, together with his wife with her and they opened the Bible together. And this is the heart of our work opening the Bible with our Jewish contacts, helping them understand the gospel and answering their questions and objections so that they may recognize and receive Jesus as their Jewish Messiah. Celeste is one of more than 150 Jewish people who have come to faith through the ministry of Christian Witness to Israel over the last four years. So if anyone doubts, the, gospel-y, the gospel really does work. After that, Paul asserts that the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So with the emphasis on believing and persistent faith is in view here. The Greek present tense is used, so it signifies continuous action. Paul is not only referring here to the first moment of salvation, as the person bows his knees and prayerfully accepts Jesus as Lord, but it is that through the power, through the gospel, the power of God starts to work in our lives, to transform us gradually to the way that we were meant to be. Alex is a good example of this. When my Israeli colleague Igal met him for the first time, he was wasting away through the power of drugs. As Igal was sharing the message of Jesus with him, something happened and he expressed faith in Jesus and also a longing to be freed from drugs. Egal then brought him to a messianic rehab house and a long time of restoration followed. But during this period, Alex exhibited persistent faith in Jesus, evidence that the, that the power of God was at work in his life. And in the couple of years that followed, 
Alex became a dedicated disciple of Jesus. He became clean from drugs, started attending a local congregation, and even occasionally joined Egal in his evangelistic outreaches. Some time later, we even received a beautiful photo of Alex and his bride, with Egal standing next to them on their wedding day. So, jumping back to the text, Paul now states two facts at once. The gospel, he says, is for everyone. It's universal. And whether you are Jew or Gentile, Arab, German, British, Dutch, American, whoever you may be, you are welcome to come to God and be saved. But at the same time, Paul adds, the gospel is to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But what does the word first mean here? There, does it indicate a chronological order or an order of priority? In other words, is Paul here telling us what has happened or what should happen? There are many who say that the first reading is a correct one. The Jews were God's people, and it is through them that the Messiah, Jesus, came into the world. Thus, they were privileged to be the first recipients of the gospel. But as they rejected Jesus and his message and the gospel for the most part, and became hardened, they lost their special status and opportunity, and with that, the gospel went to the nations. I believe, however, that a second reading of this text makes more sense and is the correct one. Let me mention a few reasons in closing. So first, in this theologically tightly packed section of the letter, it would seem pointless to merely state a historical fact that the gospel was first preached in Israel to Jewish people. Second, in chapter 2 we, real, we read a parallel expression in a different context. There we read Paul say that tribulation and distress will come upon the soul of every man who causes evil, first the Jew, and also the Greek. Here Paul makes it clear that because God is righteous, no one can be excused. Here it is clear that first the Jew does not indicate chronological order, but a priority, a degree of seriousness. Third, when we read Romans 1.16, it seems most natural to understand the word is as governing the tense of the whole sentence. So, if the gospel still is the power of God, then it is, sti then it is still to the Jew first. But fourthly, and most importantly, in this letter, Paul dedicates three chapters to speaking about Israel's place in light of the gospel. In chapter 11, he says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. He also adds, they are enemies because of you, for the sake of the gospel, but beloved because of the fathers through election. Thus, despite the fact that the majority of my nation has rejected the gospel and have been largely hardened, God still is not done with them. And a church that wants to see Jewish people restored to their God and their Messiah 
will be passionate and proud about the gospel and will pray and work to recover Paul's missionary heart and mandate to the Jew first. Amen. What is God doing in the Muslim world? 3P Ministries is a small group working in the Arab, Turkic and Persian worlds. We help church planting by mobilizing, training, networking and doing follow up with local people in these countries. The three P's are for planting churches, prayer and in areas of persecution. I want to share some encouragement from this challenging part of the world and also what we've been learning and I hope it is also relevant to you in your context. I want to begin with an experiment. I'm going to say a word and you have to remember what picture comes into your mind. You ready? The word is church. What picture came into your mind? 
If I did this experiment in the street, what do you think most people in Ireland or Europe would say? I think many would say a building. That's what came into their mind. And it's understandable because we have many church buildings around us. In fact, in Ireland, more church buildings than pubs these days, as so many pubs have closed. We often picture buildings, even though some like this that were used in the past for Christian activities have actually changed hands. If I drove from my home to Hamilton Road Presbyterian in Bangor to deliver this talk, I would probably pass about 50 church buildings in that short 14 miles. There are around 12 in Hollywood alone, which only has about 12,000 people. In East Belfast, Templemore Avenue is a short street, only 700 metres long. On this one street, there are six church buildings. At the end of the street, or just off it, there are another five. So, within an 11 minute walk, I could pass 11 different church buildings. My colleagues and I work in 11 Muslim nations in the Arab, Turkic and Persian worlds. Some of those countries have more than 35 million people, but there are less than 50 churches in the whole of the country. That is the equivalent of Ireland with only 10 house churches to serve and reach the whole island, or Northern Ireland with only three house churches for the whole region. Imagine if that were true, we would say we have a lot of work to do. These are sobering statistics and they present a challenge. I've talked about church buildings and I've talked about house churches. The word for church that is used in all 109 verses in the New Testament is the word ecclesia. It never means a building. It always means a group of people. The New Testament Christians didn't have buildings. They came much later. We see Stephen in Acts 7, 48, saying the Most High does not live in houses made by hands. Shortly after he said this, they killed him. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Paul reinforces this by saying, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? We really are the temple of God. It's never a building. I try hard to remember to use the word church to always mean people, and as people, a church may or may not have a church building. For the next month, try and use the word church to only refer to people and see how you get on. Now, I'm not saying buildings are wrong, but the building is not the church. The church is the people. It's not just semantics. It's important theology, and it affects our strategy and focus in the Muslim world. In many countries, we ask them to draw pictures of what church means to them. Here are a few examples from around the world. You can see this girl has drawn a picture of church that refers to mission. Someone else has drawn a picture that refers to persecution. In this picture, we see the importance of meal and eating as a family. In this picture, we see relationship. And in this picture, the church, which has a building, is reaching out and planting groups all over the place, multiplication. And in this picture, the church is meeting under a tree around the word of God. In the Arab, Turkic and Persian world, there are generally three kinds of churches. Firstly, there are registered churches which can use the local languages, Arabic or so on. And an example of that is this Presbyterian church in Cairo. Those churches have been there for many hundreds and in, in the case of the Orthodox Church, for thousands of years. Another type of church are registered churches for guest workers, foreigners. And examples of this are the different types of church that are in the Gulf in the Arabian Peninsula or the Russian speaking churches in Central Asia. They are not geared for the local ethnic groups and the local languages, but for foreigners. 
Thirdly, there are underground churches that use the local language and the local culture and are most suitable for those from a Muslim background. These are the kind of churches that we're focusing on. We spend a lot of time in the countries we work in, but at the moment we're not able to travel the way we used to. So we're using Zoom and other uh, ways of communicating with people. Recently, we did some online training with some people in North Africa, and we asked, what is a church? What would you say? One young girl who has only been a believer three months immediately said, a church is a group of people following Jesus together. A church is a group of people following Jesus together. What a beautiful, simple and biblical response. In that country, there are not many churches of any kind, and we used some fun activities to develop vision, strategy and planning for church planting. Jesus used many illustrations from nature, and here is one that we used that the North Africans found both fun and helpful. What can we learn from animals? Let's begin by looking at the elephant. Now, the elephant takes about 18 years before it is sexually mature and able to get married but start a family. Humans are fertile every month, but the elephant is only fertile four times every year. The pregnancy for humans lasts nine months, but for an elephant, it lasts almost two years. Every pregnancy is only one baby elephant, no twins, no triplets. So if you take two elephants that have reached maturity, they can get married and you put them in a room after one year, if you go back, there will be still two elephants, the male and female. After two years, if you go back and open the door, then you might find three, but probably two, three if the female got pregnant very quickly. If you go back after three years, if everything has gone well, hopefully you will find three elephants. Rabbits after four months are able to get married and have babies. They are always able to get pregnant. They don't have the same kinds of cycles. The pregnancy only lasts a month and there are on average seven babies per pregnancy. So if you take two rabbits, they can get married after four months. If you put them in a room after one year, if you go back, you could see 450 rabbits. If you go back after two years and open the door, you could find over 6,000 rabbits. If you go back after three years, if you can open the door, there could be 476 million rabbits. Which is the best animal? Well, they're both good in different ways. Elephants are strong if you want to move tree trunks or something like that, or for transport. But in terms of feeding people and looking after and simplicity, rabbits are much more practical. And the same is true for churches. Elephant churches, big churches that need a lot of resources can be useful. But in terms of multiplication, in terms of starting churches all over the place, in every village, and every town, then the rabbit simple model is much more practical. There are many advantages of house churches. They are simple, they're flexible, they're easier to take part in and easier to find leaders who can lead in a simple way. They're easy to reproduce. They're easy to adapt to local culture. They're very cheap to run and they're better for persecution and many other reasons as well. For centuries, there has been little progress in reaching Muslims in large number. There were a few individuals or families here and there, but not like what we see in the New Testament with thousands of believers and churches being started. David Garrison is one person who has studied movements. In other words, large numbers of people, more than a thousand, coming to faith in a short space of time. In the first 1300 years after the birth of Islam, there were just three movements in the Muslim world. In the first 60 years of the 20th century, there were another two. But in the last 40 years of the 20th century, there were 11, so things were beginning to speed up. 
From the year 2000 to 2013, there were another 69. And now in 2020, there are around 400 movements of Muslims following Jesus. God is at work and more Muslims are finding Jesus than ever before. Sometimes the most difficult areas are the most fertile. Here is one example from a very difficult country. In this country, people are starting simple house churches. You can see the one with the green circle, which is uh, four people, and that is the mother church. It has started four more churches, which are second generation daughter churches, and they're also following up some individuals. These second generation daughter churches have in turn started four more third generation churches, grandkids. And some of these churches are reaching out as well. And you can see the dots in one of the circles. That is a group of people who are seeking. They're not believers yet, but they're meeting as a group and discovering who Jesus is. We need a lot more of this kind of thing. We need good viruses, the virus of the good news and church planting to spread throughout these nations. I met some Syrians who have become followers of Jesus and I asked why. They said as Muslims, they looked all around at war, destruction, hatred, Muslims killing Muslims, and they began to think there must be a better way. They began to study Jesus and in him saw a man of peace and started to follow him. In another country, some believers caught a vision to reach the Muslims in their land. Muslims couldn't go to the legal registered churches. They wouldn't be allowed, and even if they wanted to, it wouldn't be suitable for them. So these brothers and sisters took the good news to the people, to their homes, to their culture, and the results have been very encouraging. They have started hundreds of small groups. They look for key people who are open, people who have family and friends who are interested in hearing the good news, and as a group, they meet, share stories, drink lots of tea, ask good questions, and if a whole family can come to faith together, then you have a community of believers, a church, and somewhere to meet and grow and multiply from to continue the journey of discipleship. With coronavirus, they realized there was a shortage of sanitizers, so they made some and took it to the people to give practical help. They have had lots of opportunities to share Jesus and pray with people. They've been giving practical help and many have got into groups to discover more who Jesus is. Is it easy? No, there is persecution, sometimes from government, sometimes from radical groups, and sometimes from families. Some of our friends have been kidnapped by radical groups and warned to stop, but they love God and they love the people. So they keep going, overcoming fear with love in boldness and wisdom. Before Jesus left this earth, he gave his disciples a command that we call the Great Commission. We often think that the command is go, but in Greek, the actual command isn't go, it's make disciples of all nations, everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. It's easy to think that Jerusalem would be easy for the disciples, but for most of Jesus' disciples, they were from Galilee. Jerusalem was a difficult foreign place for them, with religious and political authorities against them. We are supposed to make disciples everywhere, not just where it is easy. How do we do that? We believe that the church is central to God's strategy. It's what Jesus had taught the disciples to start communities, followers in groups. It's hard to be a disciple on your own. Jesus said he would build his church and the church is important. Praise God for the fruit that he is giving in the Muslim world. God is at work. Pray for our brothers and sisters who are working in these challenging nations. Let's also share the good news with Muslims we meet here in our contexts. We have a lot of freedom in our homes, buildings, to share with Muslims. May the good news of Jesus and communities of Jesus followers continue to grow and multiply like a good virus until he comes back again. In our second uh, look at 1 John, we're going to focus on the well-known words of 1 John 2, 15 to 17. 
where John writes, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride and possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. As the Apostle John spells out for us what it means to live wholeheartedly, blamelessly, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, he tells us that we've got to make sure we deal properly with the world. Don't love the world or the things that are in the world. For John, the world here is shorthand for every value, every instinct, every pleasure, every activity, every aspiration that opposes or competes with God. To love the world or the things in the world is to prize or choose anyone or anything over God himself. And to state the obvious, it's an issue for all of us. The world, you see, is a many tentacled monster that changes shape instantly and constantly and undetectably to allure all of us. In Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, if you've read the book or seen the movie, uh, you might remember a lesson in which Professor Lupin's Defense Against the Dark Arts class have to confront a creature called a bog art. Now, a bog art is a creature which assumes the form of your greatest fear and is to be overcome by the ridiculous charm, in case you are worried. But the bog art's genius lies in, in confronting every individual in precisely the way that they're most scared of. Now, John's depiction of the world here is similar, except the world has the ability to present itself not in the form that we find most scary, but the form in which we find most attractive. See, when we hear those words, don't love the world or the things of the world, it may be calling out our longing for praise for other people or for respect. It may be exposing our desire to look good and feel good. It may be a jarring call to break with our need to feel financially secure or our need to come first or our need to lose ourselves periodically in a, in a box set and a glass of something that we like to drink. You see, there's a sense in which if we don't feel uncomfortable as we read these verses, perhaps we could go as far as saying if we don't feel the pull of the world, even as we're told not to love it, then we don't get the scope and the seriousness of what John's talking about here. You see, the world is everything that's not of God. It's everything, to use John's language, that isn't light and truth. And John tells us not to get sucked into that. John uses the word love over 50 times in his writing. And this is the, the only place that he tells us not to love something. And he tells us not to love the world. For this is the very opposite of everything that God has rescued us from and is calling us to. For loving the world is the antithesis of living a gospel-shaped life. You can see that's what he's arguing in verse 16. See, his definition of what loving the world looks like describes an unholy trinity of internal dysfunction. What does it mean to love the world? Well, for John, it's all about the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. Now, in this letter, John, as a pastor, is not trying to be completely balanced. He's not trying to present a carefully nuanced account of how, in the wake of the fall, the image of God in us is marred but not completely effaced. He's not trying to give us a complete treatise on what's good and bad in this life. He's writing to stop people, give in to whatever sinful urges and instincts that get traction on our hearts and minds. He says, you, I, need to deal with the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the pride of life as they hit you. See, for all of us, there are some physical appetites that demand to be satisfied. Whether it's the adrenaline rush of danger or the post-exercise flood of endorphins or the synapses that are triggered by the first bittersweet draft of good coffee in the morning or the peerless sensation of chocolate melting on our tongue or the chips crunching between our teeth or the numbing bliss of pressing next episode or even better just lying on the couch waiting for those lovely Netflix people to take the next decision out of our hands. It's these desires of the flesh which are wooing our hearts. 
And John says they're accompanied by the desires of the eyes. Now the eyes here are the gateway to our minds and so our wills. And John's point is simple. Not only do we have to deal with what's already going on internally, the desires of the flesh, by sim- but simply by opening our eyes in the morning, we invite a barrage of suitors into the bedroom of our minds. Oh, I'd really like one of those. Oh, he's nice. She looks terrible. Note to self, make sure you never wear anything like that. Look at how he treats her. Because of that, I'd love to be treated like that. Perhaps I should change the way I act. You see, simply by looking around us, we unlock all kinds of possibilities for happiness apart from God. It's no accident that the language here is worrying like that at Genesis 3 verse 5, where Eve sees the fruit and sees that it is to be desired to make one wise. And Joshua chapter 7, where Achan explains that he defied God's command to take loot from a condemned city like this. I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar, Babylon, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, and I coveted them and I took them. It's like the very tragic narrative of 2 Samuel 7, uh, sorry, 2 Samuel 11. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from his roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman and one said, Is this not Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers after seeing her and took her. She came to him and he lay with her. You see, the love of the world is the desires of the flesh and it's also the desires of the eyes. And then there's the pride of life. Calvin says this covers ambition, boasting, contempt of others, blind self-love and headstrong self-confidence. Now that's more than enough to be getting on with. Not pleasant, but a clear and present danger for all of us. Now, we could go on for ages trying to pin down a perfect definition of what it means to love the world, but my suspicion is we already know. Or if we're currently managing to pretend to ourselves that we're immune from this, a moment's honesty should be enough to bring it back to the surface with the Spirit's help. Where do you routinely feel the tug? What's the familiar battleground for you? Is it self-indulgence or self-promotion or self-interest or self-preoccupation? I suggest that before we go any further that you take a minute to face and name the particular form that the many-headed worldliness monster is taking for us right now. And as we name it in our heads, let's hear these words. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. Of course, it should simply be enough for God to tell us not to do this. But we're still broken, vulnerable, flawed people whose instincts and consciences and impulses are still all over the place. And we need all the help we can get to love God rather than the world. Which is why God, through the Apostle, continues and gives us what comes next. The first reason not to love the world is in verses uh, 15 and 16. Because it's incompatible with the love of the Father. Look at what John says in the second half of verse 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The love of the Father is unique here in the Bible, but it's not hard to understand. This is the love which the Father has lavished on us that we might become his children and heirs. A love which is then stirred up in us so that we might love the Father in return. And this love just can't exist in the presence of love for the world. I was recently bemused by a conversation with a teenage boy who uh, was from the US, but he told me he was deeply interested in the beautiful game of football. He said he was interested in the English Premier League. And I said, oh, who, who do you support? Do you follow a team? And he said, yes. He said, he said I follow Manchester United and Liverpool. I, I just couldn't speak. He looked strange at me. He said, what's wrong? I said, you you can't. You can't support Man United and Liverpool. How can you support the greatest team in the world and Liverpool? You just can't. He he said, why not? Not unreasonably. I said, no, it's just not how it works. You have to pick one team and stick with them, good times and bad, to the exclusion of all others. And loving God's like that. You can't love God and anything else, particularly not the world. 
Why not? Well, to use words from 1 John 4, in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice that dealt with his anger for our sins. This love is completely at odds with the love of the world. To know and enjoy the exclusive love of, love of the Father is to embrace the message of the cross and to reject all other loves. And then, just as a finish, John adds another reason why you, you can't mess around with this love. Uh, you can't say you love God and love the world at the same time. Because the love of the world doesn't last. Just look at 2 verse 17. The world is passing away along with all of its desires, but whoever does the will of God, who lives to please God because they know the love of God, abides forever. You see, there's a lure but no future in these desires that John's talking about. Even if the world delivers in the short term, uh, it just can't pull it off in the long haul. The world can only deliver pleasure and satisfaction that starts evaporating the moment that it's experienced. So what should we do? We should do the will of God. For the one who does the will of God abides forever. John got this straight from Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven forever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother, Jesus says in Matthew 7 and again in Matthew 12. You see, John comes up with a, another way of describing what it means to live as part of the new covenant, to be blameless. It's just to do the will of the Lord Jesus. Because if we do that, we'll abide forever. It's really hard to capture the nuance of John's words in English. Abide is good. It sounds a bit old-fashioned. Eugene Peterson in the message comes pretty close. Whoever does what God wants is set up for eternity. But, but it's even more than that. To abide in God forever is to fill our lungs with his love, to bask in his security, to feel his energy coursing through our veins, to know that we are his and he is ours. This is what we're swapping for the fleeting sensations of pleasure when we choose to love the world. How dumb is that? No wonder Augustine in the 4th century wrote, Hold fast, for he became temporal that you might become eternal. Don't love the world, because the world doesn't last. Don't love the world, because the Father loves you and wants to enjoy life with you forever. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in to Bangor Worldwide Online. We hope you'll join us tomorrow morning at half past 11 for the morning Bible readings with Gary Miller. There are other things happening through the week and you will find the details on the website by going to www.worldwide2020.org. Before you go, we'd like you to watch this little video which explains how you can give to the various missionaries and mission agencies which Bangor Worldwide supports. We need your help more than ever this year since we are not able to take up our offerings in the usual way. You can give via text, online, or by check. Please watch the video which will give you more details. You can also watch it again later. Thank you for your support of Bangor Worldwide and thank you for watching. Good night. <laughs>